Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Vegas 3 Blades versus Volkov. I'm Paul Shaughnessy, joined in studio, finally, by COVID, Cody Saftik, here with us. Finally. I, I got really sick of looking at your board, I'm not going to lie. Well, you looks like we're finally safe in here, Paul. I trust you that you right? didn't do anything crazy. I took a tape measure. I'm pretty sure <laughs> we're like... Like five and a half, six feet apart here. Yeah, this is like Curtis Blades and Volkov's reach away from each other. So mm -hmm. that should be about good. <laughs> yeah, I trust you didn't get nothing in the woods. So we are in the clear. But yeah, no, dude, happy to be back in studio. I mean, obviously with the city kind of shut down, makes it difficult to move around, different moving parts. But uh, obviously I love chatting fights. We've been on a run. Hopefully that doesn't end just because we're in person. But feels good to see you, buddy. Yes, sir. Let's uh, just get right into the action here. Last week I kind of told you that well, not kind of told you. I told you that Curtis Blades was on my parlay with Julia Avila. Avila, I mean, First she like. made it look about. I saw people talking about how Gina she was too big like of a these. favorite, and it was just like, well, clearly she should have been like a minus two thousand favorite. Well, I had Curtis Blades as part of that parlay. That's to cash this weekend, and I had her Blades as well with like Amanda Nunez from two weeks ago. So like, I have a lot of money riding on Blades now. He's up to minus four hundred. Volkov can be had for plus 320. I'm a little bit less inclined at this price. I had it at 225, up to 300. That's cool. I see some people finally starting to come back on, uh, on Volkov. There's a little bit of money coming in. I understand it's heavyweights, but the way I look at this fight, I don't think Volkov has the power to keep Curtis Blades from advancing on him. And if, if Blades is advancing on him, he's going to secure those takedowns. When he gets those takedowns, I mean, the guy, you got to think back to, like, the Overeem fight. Like, he bounced that dude's head off of the canvas multiple times. It was a nasty knockout. Only person who's been able to stop this guy is my boy, Frankie Murder. And frankly, nobody on earth, if you eat one of those clean punches, is going to take it. So, like, you can't. And, and, and in his defense, in the first time, it was the eye injury that, you know, in round two, and it looked like maybe Blades was coming True. on, but his eye was... Downs, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was 100%. He was so, it's, there's no, nothing off of his back losing twice to Frankie Murder. Most guys in the heavyweight division, my opinion, I think all guys in the heavyweight division right now, are going to suffer the same fate. Um, but yeah, Blades, minus 400. I still think he wins. I think you can add him to parlays. I just don't... I'm in a weird spot because I got him at a better price, so it's... I'm not adding more parlays right now because I have a lot riding on him as it is at a better price. But I would consider, I mean, if you end up having him on your, you know, famous parlays. Well, I'm sure he's going to be because yeah. with this kind of price tag, you have to parlay them. Up. I, I mean, I always tail, I always up. tail those at least. But uh, that's where I'm at on this one. Where are you? Yeah, no, fair enough. Not only does Curtis Blades just have those two uh, setbacks against Frankie Murder, but he's only 29 years old. Like, he's developing every time out. I'm sold on this guy pretty much everywhere. His striking, pretty good. To be honest with you, pretty good striking. <clears throat> Pace seems to check out. He's aggressive. He's in your face. His wrestling's good. He's one of these guys at elevation, and we keep talking about how everybody at elevation is just on a sweet roll right now. They're doing so good. But one thing, even if they are losing, one thing you got to give these guys universally is they got great cardio. So even though we haven't seen Blades in a five-round fight, even though we haven't had see him extended beyond three rounds you just get that impression that even if this thing does go late he's not going to be Fabrice over doom toppling over after four rounds against mm -hmm. Volkov he's going to be just still going at it same thing with the Justin Willis fight seven takedowns against Willis drops Willis with his clean left hand as well in the stand-up exchange like it's a good performance but it's just a grinding effort that's the way he goes Shamil Abdurakimov five takedowns just grinds this guy the Alistair Overeem fight as you mentioned just takes this guy down grinds him but it's the last fight against Junior DeSantos he doesn't get him down Mm -hmm. They're half-hearted attempts. He tries three or four of them, doesn't get Dos Santos down, but it doesn't matter. He just goes back to the fact that I've improved, largely my stand-up. He's one of the more athletic guys in the division. He's fast, and he's unlike a Walt Harris where he has that, that speed and athleticism, and it just it wears off after five minutes. He just keeps chugging along. <clears throat> so going back to Volkov, Volkov in recent memory, geez, you know, he's six foot seven. He's got an 80-inch reach himself. He stays to the outside. He throws tons of strikes, especially as a heavyweight. Mm -hmm. But we got to go back to Volkov 
for who Volkov is and who Volkov has always been. Seven pro losses on his record, right? His first loss, three fights in his career, he loses to Akhmed Solomov. Solomov takes him down, arm bars him. His second pro loss to Maxim Grishin. Grishin takes him down, chokes him out with a rear naked choke. His third pro loss, this one's interesting actually, he loses to Pat Bennett. Pat Bennett was a journeyman three and two fighter out of the team bomb squad in New York. The fight was ruled a draw. Despite Pat Bennett easily taking down Volkov, controlling the whole fight, they ruled it a draw. So egregious that the Russian M1 commission was like, all right, fuck it, Pat Bennett, you won, and gave him the fight. The Russians originally, originally the Russians ruled the draw. Re, redid a Russian victory because they were like they, they couldn't argue against the fact that Pat Bennett was literally on top of him the entire fight. Just took him down, didn't do a whole lot. Just took him down, and the, and that, there's their secondary problem. Somehow out there, there's your secondary Fedor problem. Beat Fabio <laughs> your second, yeah, that was a crazy fight. That was nuts. Your secondary problem is not even that he. The first problem is that he's not stuffing takedowns. The secondary problem is that that being six foot seven, being that long, even though he's got a good armbar, he's got a good triangle, he's got good long man submissions off his back. He's not submitting Curtis Blades from his fucking guard. Let's be honest here. No. And he, he doesn't have the grappling. To, I don't think to consistently be getting back up. Abdul Rakhimov's a thick, tough Russian fighter. He's gonna find a way back up. Uh, some of these other guys, Alistair Overeem. Sambo background. Too, right, right? Al Alistair Overeem, he's, he's a strong guy, veteran fighter. He's going to work his way back up. Volkov won't have that success. Anyways, that's just three losses into his career, right? His fourth career loss, Vitaly Minikov, who takes him down, smokes him on the ground, and then drops him standing up. Fourth career loss, Tony Johnson takes him down. Chai Congo takes him down. Into his UFC run. That's where we're forgetting about who he is. His UFC run is just littered with guys that weren't going to fucking take him down. If we're honest here, Timothy Johnson barely half-heartedly tried to take him down. Roy Nelson, 40 years old, not going to take him down. Knee shot, barely even tries to take fights down anyways. Stefan Struve, 7 feet tall, not taking the fight mm -hmm. down. Fabricio, gassed out after four rounds. Terrible game plan. Did actually take him down three times, by the way. Derek Lewis, he's not shooting a single takedown. And Greg Hardy just doesn't have the means to take this fight to the ground, nope. even if he wanted to. So we're getting away from this idea of that, like, oh, he has suspect takedown defense. Like, just, no, that was the blueprint to beat him. Mm -hmm. Matchmaking has made it so that he can kind of hide it and get he's away a with manager, it a little bit. I guess. But Blades should just theoretically just put it on this guy. He can strike with him when he wants to. Don't rule out Blades knocking this guy standing. No. But he can put it on him when he wants to. But Blades has got great, good ring IQ. He puts it on you until you're shot held up against the cage with your hands, and then he just takes you to the ground. Yeah. And then he just smashes you. If you want to get back up, maybe you do get back up, but then he takes you back down. It's a smothering game. You, know, you got it at a great price tag, sure. I'm here to tell the audience as of this moment whether it's a good bet. Not 400. That is what he should be, in my opinion. Yeah, I think he wins, it's high. I think he wins I at least 80%. I like, get if they fight it, 10 yeah. times, I think he wins at least 8, maybe 9. Maybe 9. And you know what? If it was 8, I think it's 9 too. If it, if it was 8, you'd say, well, you know what? Heavyweights be heavyweights. Got a puncher's chance. It's like, that's fair. But he's been knocked out by just the greatest power puncher in the history of heavyweight MMA. And Volkov is just not a power. He would have yeah. to hit you 120 have times. That's the perfect shot. And that's going to happen in Which heavyweight happen. MMA. Or it's going to happen in this knee. division more than any. Yeah. But Volkov isn't the guy that usually does that. The other path for Volkov... It's just volume, and maybe Blaze just really struggles to get those takedowns. That's and he wins a decision or like a late finish because so Volkov just outpaces him, and that's that's the other possibility that yeah, could happen yeah, yeah. here. That's not what I'm betting on. That's what, not what I think is going to happen. But it sounds like we're on the same page. Blades. Yeah, yeah. My gut feeling's over three and a half, but I, I couldn't tell you if Blades is going to win a decision or a TKO. He's not submitting Volkov. Let's be real here. But no. either he just smashes away at him, finishes him late. Or he wins a decision. However, because Volkov, being so tall, head in the air, Lewis catches him in the third round, for example. Other fights in his career, Minikov, left hand drops him. Because he is, I, I could see a world where Blades just cooks this guy up. Junior's got a famous chin. You know, Junior can take a punch. The only guys that ever stopped Junior are the Cain Velasquez of the world and the Alistair Overeems of the world. They're amongst the best in the world. Either he's completely shot and he's down, or like Blades is making those improvements. Again, you go back to 29. It just seems like it just seems like that's the move. So I would have to say, yeah, the price tag is a bit big, but I would have blades. As far as ninety four hundred dollars go on DraftKings, we'll get to that later. Makes sense as well. We have Shane Burgos taking on Josh Emmett. Shane Burgos minus one thirty five favorite. Uh, Emmett can be had for plus one fifteen, close to a pick. I'm slight. Edge to Burgos here. Who do you got, Cody? Well, you mentioned how if Blades fought Volkov 10 times, that maybe it's eight or nine times Blades. That, at least how we're seeing it. They, these guys fight 10 times. It might be 5-5. Five, five. Like, yeah. this is a very... It, it's an evenly matched fight in that what Burgos doesn't do well is he's super hittable, maybe has a tad bit of a suspect chin, and he's not the fastest guy. And a slow starter. Mm -hmm. What Emmett doesn't do right is that he's got so much power, he kind of relies just on the power. He and doesn't no really, volume. No, he doesn't put in the work, you know? He just he waits on the shot, waits on the shot, bang, there's the shot. Looks pretty on paper. 
but could also go easily against him as well. So this is a tale of two fights. If they fight 10 times, you're going to get multiple results. Either Burgos is able to avoid those power punches, and he's just going to pick away at Emmett on volume all day, or Emmett lines him up with one of those big shots and puts him away. And, and listen, i got to give Emmett all the credit in the world. This guy's got hellacious power, and even though he's 35 years old, he's a great athlete, moves well, uh, pr fairly dynamic. His gas tank, I'm going to say it's good. He doesn't seem to be gassing in his fights, but he's not pushing a crazy tempo. He's not throwing more than 30, 40 strikes. His opponent, they don't want to get lined up by that buzzsaw of a right hand he's got, so they kind of keep the distance away. It's not as if someone's pushing a pace on him, whereas I, I fully expect Burgos to do that. Um, yeah, I just look at Burgos strictly by the numbers. This is a guy that routinely, if he gets into his rhythm, and he generally gets in his rhythm more often than not, is going to score more than 100 significant strikes on you. His last fight against Amir, uh, Amir, Maquan Amir Khani, sorry, 105 significant strikes. Fight before that, mm -hmm. Cub Swanson, 134 significant strikes. The Calvin Cater fight. This guy landed 40 significant strikes in round two on Calvin Cater, who is just a dynamic striker who's known for his defense. The guy, when he's on, just volume, 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 mm -hmm. volume, volume. But you can't deny that, A... Emmett's got the kill switch. Yeah, and C Cater did catch him in the third round and knock him out. Kurt Holliba dropped him. Ah, he's smiling the whole way down, but Kurt Holliba did sting him with the left hand and put him down. If Emmett lands that shot on you... And by the way, I said he, land, he landed 134 on Cub Swanson. Well, Cub Swanson likewise landed 129 on him. He's there to be hit. And Cub Swanson doesn't pack a whole lot of power. He's a volume bunger. He's a dynamic puncher, but he's not that one-hitter-quitter kind of guy that Emmett's proven to be. And I'm not even just buying too much to, like, Emmett's power. Oh, man, this guy just cracks. It's like, it's a legitimate list of guys that he's blasted away. We'll start with Felipe Arantes. He drops him six times. Doesn't knock him out, but drops him six times. The Ricardo Lamas fight, KO of the year, you worry for Lamas' health. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the same thing happens to him in the Jeremy Stevens fight, but he drops Jeremy Stevens in the first round. Imagine if he stops Jeremy Stevens in that first round. Then now, all of a sudden, he's on a six-fight winning streak yeah. where he's knocked out Ricardo Lamas, Jeremy Stevens, Michael Johnson, and Merced Bektich. He's a title contender. Mm -hmm. He's a legitimate title contender. But Stevens got back up, and Stevens laid him out. And that's why MMA's a bitch. It, it, turns on, it turns just like that. So I can't discredit anything that Emmett's done. He is way faster than Burgos. Mm -hmm. He's more dynamic. And because this is only three rounds, if Burgos does his late come on thing and doesn't score that finish, he might just be down on the scorecards. That could be a legitimate problem. Just like when he was down against Charles Rosa. Maybe he's down on the scorecards, but he gets that third round finish. I don't want to rely on that. Anyways, it's variantly even. I want to just tell you Dogger Pass. That is the move. However, we're just going to go full greasy theory on this, which oh, is why I'm going like to take it. Burgos. First of all, Burgos has had six fights in the UFC. I've never bet against him. So, like, why start now? He is my boy. We'll give him that. He's got the one loss to cater. Outside of that, he's done me good. i got to stay with him. It's sad that you never get a good price on him. He's always a favorite. At least this is a good price. Mm -hmm. Anyways, the greasy theory is going to go to Team Alpha Male. You think about Team Alpha Male, and it's like, okay, what is going on there? It seems like the gym's kind of in turmoil. You know, the, who's the greatest fighter to ever come out of Team Al Alpha Male? My opinion, this is just my opinion, TJ Dillashaw. TJ Dillashaw never realized his true potential until he left Team Alpha Male. He got with a real striking coach, Dwayne Ludwig. He prospers, he goes on. Joseph Benavides. Joseph Benavides, probably the second most, you know, outside of favor, of, co of course. But we got Joseph Benavides. He hits a second career resurgence, gets all the way to another UFC title shot after he leaves Team Alpha Male and goes, goes to Las Vegas, right? This past weekend, we got Cynthia Calvillo. Last weekend, we got Cody Garbrandt. Fuck, they both look good, man. Cody Garbrandt had to leave, go to New York, Mark Henry, get with those guys. Since the Calvillo leaves, she goes to AKA San Jose. Now you're seeing those guys at their best. I was all in on Andre Feely. Who's Josh? I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad Andre Feely got the decision last weekend yeah. because hey man, I'm on him. I got the decision. I think he deserved to get the decision, but he he didn't look great. No, it wasn't his best performance. No, it wasn't his best shot. performance. When you look at some of the other guys that have been in that gym recently, Song Yudong, uh, Anthony Hernandez, Fluffy Hernandez, he got smoked out by Hall and so fast. Guy guys cut. Should be in the UFC. Yudong, obvious. He, uh, honestly, he did not look good. He could have lost that decision. To Marlon choose. Vera is all over his. There were ass. a lot of people screaming oh. robbery, and I can't. I don't know if it was a robbery but it was close, oh. close fight. So the coaching staff there, my boy Mike Malott's in charge, so I'm not trying to bash them by any means. This is coming just from my heart here. The, the coaching staff there, it's a little bit, it's always been. Remember Master Thong was the striking coach then? Ludwig comes in. Then Martin Cantman was there for a bit. It's always and been then, dramas there. Right, and then Faber, you know, he's retired. He's just going to be the head coach now. And then Faber's angling to, to step in for Yadong on a week's notice. Like, is it a financial thing? I, I don't know. What I'm getting at is the gym hasn't been doing overly well. No. Right, right. Okay, so that brings me to my second thing. Shane Burgos got taken down three times versus Maquan Amerikani first round. He doesn't have great takedown defense. Emmett, theoretically, could take this guy down. But I'm going back to the Team Alpha Male thing. You know what Andre Feely's biggest problem was? The takedowns were there for him all day and all night. And for whatever reason, he just didn't go to it. 
It showed bad ring IQ. It showed maybe not the greatest. Game he wasn't plan. super prepared. He didn't have a great game plan. He wasn't prepared. Then you look at all these guys that left, went to gyms where they got actual game plans. And they all had the best performances of their careers. And so I think Emmett, and why he wins five out of ten times, is that five out of ten times he probably does land the punch. But the mm -hmm. five times he doesn't land it, he's going to he's gonna get lost after the first round. Burgos is a slow starter. Emmett probably wins I mean, the first if you round. think it's 5-5, five, five, you shouldn't be betting on minus 35. 135. No, no, but I my, my theory is leaning me towards I, I got Burgos, and I, I am a Burgos guy. He is my boy. Mm -hmm. You know that. I don't bet against him, and until until Josh Emmett proves me wrong and clean buzz saws this guy's head off, we are obviously going to get to DK at the end of the show, but if you're playing multiple lineups, you, you got to have one side of this. Yep. Either Emmett I KOs agree. this guy and he scores a ton, maybe takedowns too, and KOs this guy, scores a ton, or Burgos is going to put 120 stri strikes on him and pepper him and maybe stop him late. You're going to want exposure. Emmett's anyway. one of those, like, and yeah, it's when we get to that, bucks, Emmett's I mean, going to be one of those GPP guys that, yeah, if, if Emmett For wins, sure. he's probably in the optimal. Um, let's move on. We got Raquel Pennington taking on Marion Renault. Pennington minus 155, Renault plus 135. Um, got any hot takes on this one? I, 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 I find it hard to just bet Marion Renault. She's got to be like 40 now. 42. 42. Um, Pennington's tough, durable, pretty good grappling. I understand the line here. I think it's going to be a, dog, like a, a greasy one. It's going to go to decision. And I don't want to really trust on the judges to get it right if it's really close. So I'm probably just straight up passing here. But the pick would be Pennington if you put a gun to my head. Yeah, yeah. I think same thing. You just got to look at age as a factor right away. And I know you're going to pull this whole ages thing. But we're going to get down to this. I mean, 42, card. it's way older. Than, it's when you start. With, it's, I always give you the ages thing when you start being like, this 31-year-old guy way no. past his prime. I, that I guy, never say 31. That That's the prime you're And then I think about how old I am. And then I get defensive, and then I call you an ages. But that's, you always uh, say that, and I don't want to get all ages on. here. I don't want to get all ages here, but like, yeah, at forty-two, it's not that she can't still perform; it's that she's struggling to perform beyond five minutes. And I, yes, I know Yannis Kunitskaya; she had her best round in the third round, but that's also Kunitskaya landed so much volume in the first two rounds that mm -hmm. you know, quite frankly, she just kind of gassed herself out. I feel like Pennington's just super unmotivated. If you look at her career, she beats Misha Tate; it's a career victory, and then since then. It has been murder's row. Not only does she go five bad rounds with Amanda Nunez in which she gets stopped in the fifth, it's like, what's, what's your runner-up prize? A fight with Jermaine Durand me, which she just looked super lethargic and did, had no effort in it. And it's like, okay, she beats Irene Aldana. Not a great win. Split decision. Close fight, to be honest with you. I can see you saying Aldana won, but Raquel Pennington, rightful winner, did get the victory. And then the follow-up fight, you get Holly Holm. Like, there's just no upside here. She's 10 and 8. But it's a little bit deceiving in that she's ten and eight against what the number the best one, woman the number one girl in the world, Nunez, the number two girl, especially if you're thinking about at one forty five or like if you want to look at it that way, and Jermaine Durand to me, and Holly Holm, who's like the perennial one of the perennial top contenders, obviously like a number three in the division. So these type of spots where she's taking on a forty two Marion Renault, she has got to look better. And it's not hard to say, gee, she she looked okay against Holly Holm, she looked okay against Irene Aldana. But a step down should definitely favor her. Mary Renault needs to get the fight to the ground. She wants to get the fight to the ground. However, she's going to struggle mightily in, this, in, in the takedowns against just a bigger, stronger, more physical fighter in Raquel Pennington. Raquel Pennington also engaged to Tisha Torres on the card. They, they're, they're grinding hard, man. They're in camp right now with Rose Nama Yunus. They've been in camp the last... She's known about the fight for three weeks. They've been grinding her, Rose, and Tisha three weeks. Listen, they're both straw weights. She's a 35er. I get that part. All I'm saying is she seems to be physically in good shape. She should be ready to roll. I hope that's best case scenario for Raquel Pennington. Flip side to that for Marion Renault. Not only is she 42, she's coming off a 15-month layoff. She's on two-fight losing streak. At least she's a teacher, a gym teacher. So, like, she's probably been at home. School's she's had out, lot, dog. And she's Ain't had, nobody she's at had school. lots of time to train, I would imagine. She's a mother that's, as well. We don't, we, don't, we don't know her other commitments. But beyond that, it's the Yana Kunz Kea fight. This, this is so she has that good third round, right? But just, I just want you to realize Yana Kunz Kea was 29 to 13 significant strikes in round one for Kunz Kea. In round two, it was 40 to 18. And then she toppled over in the third round and still outstruck her 29 to 27. But it's the fight before that of Kat Zingano. Kat Zingano takes her down six times, 
Renault attempts to pull guard in that fight. She gets physically outmuscled, and she gasses out after five minutes. That was her at 40. That's what I expect here. This is not going to be a striking affair like Kunitskaya, where she gets bombed on 120 times. Not going to be that. It's going to be a grinding affair up against the cage, where she potentially gets taken down. Raquel Pennington, not known to get submitted, should just grind away at this girl. And yeah, I could see it going to decision. I see it being a close-ish decision. I don't know if I want 155 for close-ish decision, but I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, I will take it. And Raquel Pennington would be the play there. $8,800 on DraftKings, no way. But the 55 money line, I could see it. Totally yeah. do. 11 years the junior here, bud. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We got uh, Bilal Muhammad taking on Lyman Good. Bilal Muhammad, minus 120 favorite. Lyman Good can be had. Four plus 100. Lyman Good, when we talk about DraftKings, he's going to end up being uh, DraftKings Chuck because he's 7,300, and this is a pick em. Um As for... The actual fight, I mean, Lyman Good has a lot of size on um, oh, Bilal Muhammad, it? but Bilal Muhammad has a lot of speed uh, and probably cardio on Lyman Good. But Lyman Good hits hard. He's usually very inactive. Doesn't usually get very much done in the first round. But when he lays a, when he lays a, a big one on you, you feel it. And we have seen Bilal Muhammad against Vicente Luque, very, very talented striker. Sharpshooter. And Sharp Joe shooter. Ben's a sharpshooter, too. For sure. This guy's herky-jerky. He is herky-jerky. He's strong. He's, Don't get he's me strong. Wrong. He's got the power. It's very. He's very live to get that knockout. But I think if this goes three rounds, it's going to be Bilal Muhammad just outpointing, outpacing. Um, my pick is Bilal Muhammad to get the job done. But I wouldn't be shocked. I haven't, I, I'm not all that inclined to make a bet right now. As we stand on, uh, I guess you guys are watching on Thursday morning. I haven't made a bet on this at all. But Bala Muhammad is the pick. I think he just wins with volume, stays out of trouble, avoids the knockout punch. And uh, I'm going to bet on those guys, the cardio and the pace, a little bit more often. Um, Then I'm going to just bet on a guy who I think has to win by knockout. Yeah, that's fair enough. You also got to think about if we're getting into conspiracies and, you know, different ways of thinking I mean, about it. I said we're getting into that? No, no, but <laughs> we're, we're during this pandemic, we're doing this virus. Got, yeah, guys that naturally have great cardio and fight three rounds, fight five rounds. When he was a Titan FC champ, five rounds all day. Like, he's mm-hmm. got great cardio, Bilal Muhammad. Uh, those guys are going to have a natural advantage that if you call them up on three weeks' notice, chances are they're going to go extended rounds. Whereas Lyman Good... Uh, it's hard to cycle something when it's three weeks. You know, someone calls you up. It's like, fuck, man, I at least need four, or, hopefully six weeks. Or it's easy to. Yeah, okay, so let's say. Because no, nobody's coming knocking on your door. I don't know. Okay, okay, fair, fair, fair. This guy pulled out of his last fight because he had coronavirus. The card got canceled. True. But Lyman Good had corona, right, or COVID. So, well, I don't know. What's, what, did he have a good camp? Is he... Is he good to go? Is his body physically peaking? Fair. Now, Bilal Muhammad's going to have that advantage on the cardio. Now, I'll admit, Bilal Muhammad loves to mix in his wrestling with his takedowns, and that's, or his wrestling with his striking. That's what makes him effective. He stays in the pocket. He's in your face. He likes to throw output. His punches have virtually no power on them. He hasn't knocked out anybody in a very long time. Got a submission in his last fight, but, again, just not really known as a finisher. It's that being able to stay in your face, put the pace on, and mix in the wrestling. It'd be hard to take Lyman Good down, but if he can just grind him down second round, late second, start getting some takedowns, make it work for him, yeah, I definitely still blow Muhammad just pulling through. Lyman Good, as talented as he is, he's kind of been a bust in many people's opinions. He starts off his career undefeated 9-0, he's a Bellator champion, and then he never quite got there. And he tries out in the Ultimate Fighter, loses to an absolute no-name fighter on the Ultimate Fighter. This is the interesting point, though. He's been signed to the UFC for five years, Lyman Good. In those five years, he's competed five times. Bilal Muhammad, on the flip side, has been in the UFC for four years, where he's competed ten times. Like, Lyman Good, when he is here, yeah, oh, geez, he looked good against Chance Rencounter, didn't he? Chance Rencounter, who's six foot two, didn't have the wrestling to take him down. And by the way, Rencounter's putting in good work in that fight, but, but he literally just throws four punches. They all zap Rencounter flush in the face. Looks pretty good for the judges, right? Mm-hmm. Rencounter doesn't have the technical defense that Bilal Muhammad does. He doesn't pull away the, the punches the way Bilal Muhammad does. So I feel like he's not going to have that saving grace. He'll lose a decision, take Bilal, take Bilal by decision to try to get the extra little value that you can like on that. It. And uh, fight generally to go decision. But yeah, yeah eighty nine hundred yeah. Bilal Muhammad DraftKings. Well, we'll even jump. Don't man, oh, no, thank you. I think he's only scored. It, he's only scored. He's only scored above 80, 80 or he's never only scored above eighty nine points once, and that was against uh, Augusto 
Montano, I believe. That was his only TKO stoppage yeah. in the UFC. Round yeah. three, I think he scored like 108. All the other ones, Eric even Montano's when he gets... Brother. Eric Montano's Yeah, it was either Eric or Augusto. It was one of the two. The either way, Augusto. they both of them were the not... The better of the two. Both of them were not great. Um, so, yeah, all the other times, it's like, even when he gets a good win, gets a lot of volume, he's gaining around like 80. I mean, that's fine for cash, but it's not going to win you a GPP, especially on this card. We got Roosevelt Roberts taking on... Uh, Jim Miller, Roosevelt Roberts, uh, minus one or minus two twenty five favor. Jim Miller plus one eighty five. Roberts coming off of the uh, second round finish where uh, by submission of uh, Brock uh, Weaver last time out. I mean, this kid's got is long. He's got gonna have a big time speed advantage against Jim Miller. Big time. The only question that I have on this again, and Roberts' submission skills seem good. I don't know how his submission defense skills are. Fair. Jim he's Miller a has a general trend that what he does now. The guy comes in and he's trying to put you away fast because he knows he doesn't have the gas tank anymore. He's not going to have the speed to keep up with this kid. He's giving up a lot of uh, you know size and tangibles, all that type of stuff. The only thing he's got, he's a gritty old man. He's going to eat some punches to get in there. If he gets it to the ground, he may show the kid some tricks. He may have a severe grappling advantage um, offensively if he has him on top, if, if he's on top of him. He may find something. The guy's a legit black belt. So Roosevelt Roberts is not exactly, by any stretch of the imagination, a lock. I feel like if he gets out of round one, he 100% is, though. That's my problem, is that I'm getting my arm twisted into taking a poke on Jim Miller at plus 185. However, it comes down to he's got one round to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And even though I think he could win this fight based on his skill set, that win doesn't revolve around just dusting him out of there in the first round. It revolves around getting to his wrestling, staying in this guy's face. Roosevelt Roberts, for as talented as he is, he doesn't fight particularly well off his back foot. He fights good when he's moving forward towards you. But, I mean, as far as his fight with Alexander Yakovlev, Vince Pichel, Brock Weaver... Whenever you move forward on him, he's got to be a counterpuncher, not quite as effective. He's a long-rangey guy. Long-rangey guys usually aren't counterpunchers. Their timing's not quite as quick. They like to fight that Nate Diaz style where they stalk you and they kind of pick away at you from, from range, right? It's not like a Volkov almost. It's just more output than sitting down on your punches. That's what Weaver seems to have. He lands good, clean one-twos down the pipe, but it's not that big, stinging power. You move this guy back, that's where he's less effective. It's the ability to also take this guy down and grind him into the ground. Now, his record kind of looks pretty on paper, and he's got the win over Brock Weaver. The thing is, realistically, if you look at it deep, it's not that impressive. Starts off with you crushing Vince Pichel over him, where he came in as a minus 260 favorite, right? Right there, it already got the impression here's a 24-year-old kid with two fights in the UFC. By the way, those two fights are Daryl Horcher and Thomas Gifford, guys that are no longer employed with the UFC. Horcher went 1-3 and three with the organization. Gifford went 0-2. Both have since been released. Mm -hmm. But Vince Pichel, you snuff it out. All Pichel does is just big strongman him. He moves forward. He out, He's stronger in the clinch. Takedowns when he wants them. Outstrikes him. But he was able him. to do it for multiple rounds. So he's so he's able to do it for multiple rounds, right? So now the kid comes back against Alexander Yakovlev, right? In the first round, he beats Alexander Yakovlev. He's faster than him, just like he's faster than Jim Miller. He's sharper than him. He outstrikes him from the outside. The second round, Alexander Yakovlev takes him down. And when Yakovlev takes him down, Paul, even though he's a good grappler, he's scrambling, scrambling lots, throwing up submissions. He can't get back up to his feet. He's largely just grounded for the majority of the second round against Yakovlev. In the third round, He's losing the fight to Yakovlev. Yakovlev goes for a botch-ass takedown. Roosevelt Roberts ends up on top, mounts him immediately, takes his back, minute and a half left, wins the fight. Had that not happened, I wonder if Yakovlev could have not won that decision. And then finally against Brock Weaver. Brock Weaver represents the lowest level of MMA that is in the UFC right now. And to be honest, he didn't blow right through no. Brock Weaver. The first round was relatively competitive. I had him inside the distance. I had his sub Were you a little bit worried? Had... Just like a little bit worried? Yes. I was just like, First why are, three and why and are half we taking especially. like... We take this guy down, we choke him. Like, it's super... I was even tweeting at, like, probably his burner more. account, saying, like, well, let's not get... And he, let's not be crazy here. The easy way to do this is just to choke him out. You have the submission skills to do that. Let's not overthink it. He ended up getting there in round two. But, uh, yeah, he had me a little bit nervous. Um, there isn't a prop out on Jim Miller round one. But I see Jim Miller inside the distance plus 325. If we just wait for that round one prop, that could be like a juicy like six to one little punt. For sure. And oh, I feel oh like ho hold on. Do you have I have the number. 
What? In round one, Jim Miller. Round one, Jim Miller. Is your mic turned on? Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. Pat Mayo on the sticks, by the way. On the sticks. Plus 850. I'm going to throw a little, little something, something on Listen, that. Listen, when you consider that that has been his trend, but my gut feeling is... If he if he tries that he doesn't succeed and then you and don't then, have to bet much and then listen I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to preview I don't want to preview this ageist thing too much here you Paul but 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 yeah, just you hate old just, people just real quick for you right Josh Emmett's thirty five years old I think he'll have some cardio problems mm-hmm. Mary Renault's forty two years old I think she'll have some cardio problems as well but we've been betting uh, Jim, all the Jim, dusty Jim, old Jim, guys Jim, recently Jim, Jim Miller's thirty six years old I can assure you he's Glover. got about one solid round left in him Clay Guida's thirty eight years old uh, we've got. Who else is on the card that was ancient? We got Lauren Murphy on the card. We got Roxanne Modafferi on the card. It's a and and listen, these are all talented fighters. But I'm telling you, the f- feeling I'm getting is that a lot of them are going to look good for the first round, and then that's when it beyond that, that's where it becomes a problem. Mary Renault again, she looks okay in the first round against Kazingano, but beyond that, gone. Jim Miller, the trend was first round finish, first round finish, first round finish. Then he fights Scott Holtzman. Dude, he looked pretty good in the first round, but boy, oh boy, did he just get worn out and tired, and he couldn't get Holtzman down. So and then one. he's getting hit <laughs> two punches, three punches for every one he's landing back, and it's just a slow grind, and it's downwards. And Roosevelt Roberts, assuming he doesn't get taken in the first round, that slow grind will happen. But I, I, as I mentioned, I don't think he's as hot of a prospect at 26 years old. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's as hot of a prospect as people are valuing him at. He might be in for another upset like he did against Vince Bichelle. And I just, I'm getting, I'm thinking 185 is definitely worth a look. I but mean, I mean. The smart play. I'm going to have some. smart play. I'm taking that round one prop. Then go for that. I, I'm, Something I'm, small. I'm looking, I'm looking to pass at those current odds. But I'll tell you what, if you are going to play Roosevelt Roberts, and don't be surprised if I tweet out he's on a parlay, that that would be my consideration. You I wouldn't. Have, have I don't want to bet. One I don't want to bet two hundred twenty-five dollars on Ro- on Roosevelt Roberts who a hundred dollars against Jimmy. Like that I that I don't want. But if I had him on some parlays, I knew what I was getting myself into. He could add some value. Maybe you know if you want to get ballsy and take the risk. But I got a I got a bad feeling about this kid. Bobby Green takes on Clay Guida. Bobby Green minus two thirty-five favorite. Clay Guida plus one ninety-five. Who you got? Bobby Green got to have some Bobby Green here. I mean, the guy's too entertaining to not keep around the UFC. But at some point, he's got to get a couple victories together to at least justify having that roster spot. And I feel bad for him because you look at Clay Guida and it's like, oh man, this guy's on a bad run. You know, he's on what three fight losing streak. He's starting to get finished in these fights. Or sorry. Yeah, lost to Jim Miller, lost to Charles Oliveira. Lost, lost, look at Bobby Green, same thing, lost to Jared Carr Close. There's a big difference in the competitive natures of those fights. Bobby Green loses close decisions. That's like Bobby Green 101. It's that he's very competitive, and depending on who the judges are, he should probably be winning a lot of these decisions. He outstrikes Jared Carr Close. It was a good fight. He outstrikes Francisco Trinaldo. It's a good fight. For whatever reason, things just don't get scored for him necessarily. The fact here, though, is that he's a much better signif- he's a much better striker, significantly, mm-hmm. I would say, than Clay Guida. His boxing, much better, good shoulder roll. If he clips Guida, Guida has a legendary chin, but at 38 years old, maybe starting to leave ever so slightly. Bobby Green chews this guy upstanding. Is Guida has got to push the pace, get in his face, grind, do that classic Guida stuff. But as we talked about Alpha Male. Is he still at Alpha Male? I don't know. I don't know. And Darren Elkins, is he still at Alpha Male? Because I can tell you, those guys both also fit the trend. They both also fit the trend of they're just maybe on a bit of a downswing. Clay Guida, known historically, is in your face with his grappling on you, on you, on you. But he hasn't done that since the Eric Koch fight. And I have no reason to believe that he's going to do that here. The other thing is with Bobby Green is that you watch a lot of his fights. He doesn't mind keeping his back against the cage. He's not getting taken down. He's got good takedown defense. He shakes loose. He fights for underhooks. His grappling, not that bad. I think that even if Clay does get him down, Bobby gets up. Clay eventually relents off him. And when he relents off him, then Bobby Green should be able to touch him up. But again, you got to go back to the fact that it's Bobby Green 235. Bobby Green is always in close decisions. Why would you want to bet a guy who, you know, could have been a split with Trinaldo, lost the decision, could have been a split with Close, but lost the decision, the, the fight with Lando Venata loses the first two rounds. It's a split. The R- Rashid Magomedov fight. It's a split. The Edson Barbosa fight. Three good rounds. The Josh Thompson fight. It's a split, which I thought he lost, by the way. It's just very close fights. I don't want to bet a guy at 235 who I, I think is probably going to go to decision. And even though I think he's going to win the decision, it, it's a big enough price tag. Where I would normally say... Chase Bobby Green by decision. Clay Guida has got 19 pro losses. And even though I don't think Bobby Green's going to go out there and submit him, he has physically got his last three losses by submission, all guillotine. He stuck his head right into the choke. 
Uh, Brian Ortega knocks him out in the third round. This guy's got a cast iron chin, finally knocked out. Writing's on the wall that Bobby Crean could clip this guy, could make something happen. Maybe Clay just goes balls to the walls, gasses himself out. I don't know. He never does gas mm -hmm. out, so you can't really assume that's going to happen here. All I'm saying is I got Green. 235 is another price tag I don't agree with. In your uh, in your slander of Team Alpha Male, you forgot about Darren Elkins not really looking all that well I against Land. Did you? I threw it in there as I, I was talking. I as I, no, as I was talking about Clay Guida, I threw it in two okay. seconds ago. Oh, okay, my bad. I missed that. I was probably no, no, I was probably no. looking up that. Yes, Clay Guida. Here's a picture of him with Uriah Faber and. Josh Emmett, as of a couple days ago. And yes, so, yes, he's, yes, the downswing I theory. I don't recognize the other guys. The downswing theory could be in play. And I know people say, I don't know about the theory, man. It's like, dude, Ronda Marcos alternates wins and losses. It's in the universe. It just <laughs> happens. And I told y'all last week Charles Rosa was going to win because Charles Rosa alternates wins and losses. The, an the, an the Anthony Edgequani effect. It's in the universe, effect. Paul. Team Alpha, man, I just I don't know. Can't get behind them. It's in the universe. Something's just not. It's the, not right there. Right? I think the Anjaquani effect was the first time I got onto the Pichel train. Talking about, I was my, just gonna say, talking about Vince Pichel. my boy. Talking about Vince Pichel. Okay, yeah. So Bobby Green fight probably goes the distance, but again, not super safe on that. Don't like ninety one hundred dollars in DraftKings, and yeah, we'll yeah two thirty five again money line. Not not great, but I got him as my pick. All right, this next one. When I first looked at the odds, kind of jumped off the page. Brianna Van Buren is minus 185 favorite against Tisha Torres, plus 160. Torres is on a four-fight losing streak. But she's obviously fought. You know, Marina Rodriguez, her last time out, that was you know maybe her lowest level of competition. Otherwise, she's fighting former champions, the best of the best of the best. Usually goes three rounds, super solid. But Brianna Van Buren, like, ain't nothing to sneeze at when you're 30-27 across the board against Livy... Livia Souza, man, like that was. She kicked her ass. She showed up. She showed up, and not, like when I rewatched that fight, I was just like, "Okay, I can get on board with this." Tisha hasn't looked the same in a long time. She's getting older. Her, she's always relied on speed. She's getting older. Speed's the first thing to leave. I get it. I'm not. I'm not laying a. I don't know if I'm comfortable. You know, fading, fading Torres, putting. Buren on or Van Buren on a bunch of parlays and stuff, but I'm more on board with the line. I was really, really hoping to bet Tisha Torres. Where are you? Well, just I, I I never do, but plus 160 against somebody who's a little bit more unproven seem seemed to you know, seems seems a little bit wide to me, to be perfectly honest. Uh, before watch rewatching the Livia Livia Souza fight. Uh, now it all kind of makes sense, but nothing's really all that juicy. I don't think I'm jumping in on this one. Unless you change my mind, as always, I listen to you and just about only you when it comes to UFC fights. Yeah, no, I, I think you go with Brianna Van Bruyn all day. Did you happen to watch the Tuesday night top-ranked boxing? I do not. Anyways, it's Cameron Crayley, 17 and 15. I saw people all talking about it. Cameron Crayley, 17 and 15. Why is he on this card? I don't know. There's, there was a couple guys that should not have been on the card. All the same, it's like the scrappy Hawaiian guy. He's in there against a 10 and 0 undefeated Kaz Kazakhstan fighter. It's like, oh man, this this might not go Kazakhstan. so good. Kazakhstan. 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 <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> uh, it, it's like, oh man, this is a mismatch. This guy like boxed up uh, Triple G as an amateur. He's got 300 amateur fights undefeated as a pro. He's he's under the top rank banner. It's a mismatch. And even though he does win, since this Camel Krill guy was just super durable. He just was there to give him rounds. Mm -hmm. Even though you got a guy, he's a prospect. He's considered the boxing world prospect. He's on his way up. He's undefeated. He's got this pretty record. You can't just blow through people all the time, smoke them out of there, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, they got a pretty record. It's like you're going to have to have these gut check fights with this guy. And by the way, he gasses out by the end of like seven, and Crail puts it to him, gives him good rounds, loses the fight as he's supposed to, doesn't even, doesn't even shake his head. He's 17 and 16 now. It's just another loss. But it's just like you're there to give people rounds and to test them to be there to see what they got. That's what Tisha Torres has fallen into the role to. There was a time where she was a top contender. There was a role, there was a time that we thought that maybe, maybe she'd get to title uh, contender status. But realistically, at her height, Paul, she was never in the talks for a title shot. She never reached the altitude of, of a title I mean, shot. She had the opportunities to get to that spot. She just has always come up short in those opportunities. Of course. And then, and, and, and if you look at it in hindsight, gee, she's got a win over Rose Namajunas back in Invicta, who's a former, who, who's a future champion. Angela Hill, who's a current, you know, top fighter in the division. Uh, the fight with Michelle Watterson, another, you know, perennial contender of the division. She's got good wins. It's just that 
she, they're always sparring matches. The fights always play out as just like a sparring match, just like it's in the gym. They always go to decision. She has, what, one submission? She submitted Juliana Lima, and she, with the rear naked choke. Uh, outside of that, it's like routinely, you can almost guarantee, almost guarantee, Tish Torres fights go in the distance. Fighting way on the outside, jumping in with her speed, trying to land a couple strikes. And You're not it. going to knock her out. But likewise, she is not going to knock you out. And up until the Lima fight, and this is Lima we're talking about. This is Lima we're talking about. She didn't really have, she hadn't really shown much of a grappling prowess, but she's not going to be submitted in the same breath. So you're just going to get the three rounds of rounds out of her. So Brianna Banks, as a 26-year-old prospect at the UFC. Brianna they, Banks. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your mind at? Brianna Van Buren. I know. That's what I said in the last time we broke down her fight. Mm-hmm. She's a legitimate prospect in that she won that Invict FC one-night tournament. She defeats three fighters in one night. Looks pretty good. Comes to the UFC, again, 26. It's not just the one win over Livian Souza. It's that she did everything right in that fight. She outstruck her. She took her down. She grappled when she needed to. When she got taken down, she fought off her back extremely well. Her cardio looked good. Her poise looked good. She's five feet tall, which is crazy, but Tisha Torres is the same. Yeah, they're same. the same size. I looked into that, too. Same. And their reach is pretty much identical. Right, so, like, because, no because at, some point, at some point, someone who's a lot bigger than her is going to give her some serious issues. But Livion D'Souza is a former Adam weight as well. She's not all that big. Mm-hmm. She's extremely tactical. Great kickboxer. BJJ Black Belt. Very strong with her wrestling game. And Brianna, she, she did exactly what she had to My do. My girl Tatiana would give her some problems if she can get over her neck injuries. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Eventually, somebody who's big and physical is going to be able to give her some serious issues, or even somebody that's going to come in there with a five or six inch height advantage or a big reach advantage or whatever the case may be, she's going to have troubles down the road. But giving her someone who's just going to stand, not stand in front of her, she moves a lot, you know how mm. Torres is, but essentially we're going to give you a sparring partner here. It's going to go three. You're going to outpoint her. I, and I, I was really impressed with what I saw out of Van Buren in her debut. And again, this is someone who's developing, who they've got some investment in here. Whereas Tisha Torres, Pennington's on the card. We're going to throw them both on the card. She's on a four-fight losing streak to the absolute best fighters. But at the same time, you get the feeling that, that that's, that's her role here. So, Pat, hit me real quick. Van Buren, 185, not the greatest, but Van Buren by decision, which is, can't be much better than that. I cannot I assume. I can probably... The then. odds are not out for it yet. Okay, okay. If I'm going to try to grind off a couple points, that, that would be the play for sure. All right, we got uh, Oscar Pachota taking on Mark andre Berrio. Pachota, minus 125 favorite. Uh, Berrio, plus 105. Who you got here? Yeah, honestly, this is a fight that, again, if it plays out multiple times, you could have different paths, different avenues. Both guys have skills. Both guys lack skills. And it just depends what kind of fight we're going to see play out. Oscar Machota seems to be a sharper technical fighter, like, standing. But his stand-up's not very good. He leaves his chin out there. He can't take a great punch. He seems to, like, not have a great idea how to use his distance. Where he is best is when he's on top with his BJJ. But his wrestling, it's just okay. And as far as his BJJ goes... You can talk about this guy's credentials all day, but he's also been submitted by Gerald, Gerald Mearshart, and he hasn't scored a professional submission victory in his own career in four-plus years. So I don't know that I write Pachota as one of these. You know when we're always talking about these BJJ guys? It's, man, if the fight hits the ground, it's over. You know, they just need that little window. But they all have something in common. Generally, they're not very good wrestlers. But if the fight hits the ground, it's over. He fits in the category of not a great wrestler, good on the ground, but not great on the ground, not like them. Barrio's cast iron. Barrio's durable. But that's literally the only thing Barrio seems to be having going for him. He's durable. He fights to the end. Taking him down seems to be effortless. Uh, holding him up against the cage Sanchez seems to be... Sanchez had some struggles, at least late in the fight, because Sanchez gasses and he wasn't able to get... Sanchez those. had some troubles late in the fight, but you can't look at me in the, in the eye and say, why is Jung Young Park scoring five takedowns against Barrio? Jung Young Park, by the way, a Korean boxer, should, should not be taking down Barrio five times. Christoph Jocko, even though he struggled with the takedowns, he just smothered him up against the cage. Mm-hmm. It's a split, but he won. He's a rightful winner. Just smothered him up against the cage. Sanchez, when Sanchez got so tired he couldn't fight no more, he just smothered him up against the cage. So Barrios, I don't know. I don't want to say it's a ring IQ thing. I just think he's a super generalist, and what he's general at is very general. Like He's not a great wrestler. He's not a great striker, but he's cast iron. How can you bet a guy just on the basis of he's super durable? Mm-hmm. Well, you could because Pachota seems to gas out after about six or seven minutes. Fair. But herein lies the problem. Yeah. Herein lies the problem. Barrio Pichota does went, just doesn't throw enough volume from what I've no, seen you know in what? any of his fights now. I, th- I thought so too. And then re-watching, it's like the, the guy actually is throwing some decent volume. He just doesn't volume. land. 
Wow. His numbers according do to, not According look. to fight metric, he is landing. However, you know, nothing's got this big stinging power on him. Him versus Sanchez, just bear with me on this. Him versus Sanchez, he scored 69 significant strikes. Nice. Sanchez was on his ass the entire time. He was taken down twice. He was on his back, and he was largely up against the cage. But he's still, he still squeezing 69 strikes. Pretty good. Christoph Jocko. Jocko just swarmed this guy the whole time. He, he got outstruck by Jocko 40 to 31. They both had a strike each, and it's a split. <sighs> sure, but Jocko's a top 15 contender, so at least it's a name fighter. And then him versus Jung Yun Park, that's the, that's the anomaly to me. I don't know why he just shit such a, such a goose egg. And that's why I have to go with Pachota on a straight pick. But if I wanted to go with a dog, it's only plus 105. Maybe somebody comes on Pachota. This is probably closer to a 50-50. Sounds, sounds I think like you want to see lean. weigh-ins and I see how the rest of the Pechota. week plays out on this one. You know why my slight lean end of going towards Pachota? Because as I just laid out for you, the path, what's the path of victory for Barrio? Is that he probably loses the first round, right? Maybe second round. A, yeah, gets a second round, Pecho- third round knockout. Ah, Pachota starts getting tired in the second round, right? Barrio, Barrio loses the, maybe the first two minutes of the round, comes back, wins the second round, puts it on this guy in the third round, maybe has that late comeback. His problem is, is that that's literally what he's tried to do in his first three UFC appearances, and it has not worked. So why would I now assume it's going to? To his credit, no, no, not to his credit. Andrew Sanchez and Jocko are both better fighters than Pachota. Facts. Mm-hmm. Jung Young Park is not. So again, it's the outlier of like maybe he's not as technical. Like even his TKO run, dude. Like honestly, I watched this guy. Like what? What's his win? Adam Hunter, Brendan Kornberger. Like come on, man. Like what are we valuing him on? But I need I need a dog. He's ah, he's only one five. That's a pass. That's a hard pass. I even I have not told you to pass on most of these fights, even though you should be able to tell from the breakdowns. There's a lot of pass. This mm-hmm. is a risky card. However, I will tell you that 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 fight's a pass unless you get better dog money on Barrio. Fuck that. I'm Damn. off. To answer your question from earlier, yeah, Brianna Van Buren minus one forty-five by decision is what I see out there. But I had it listed as minus one eighty-five, pretty much across the market. It's went up like fifteen to twenty points. She's over one to- or over minus two hundred favorite, pretty much across the board. Yeah, again, you know, I we mean, talked about we want to get fifty to seventy points depending on kind of where you bet it. If you're really really confident that there's no finish happening here, I guess you take that. I've know. I've been very surprised. I don't know if this is a thing. I don't know. Just something I've noticed over the last four or five events. The props, they aren't mashed very properly. It's if you're a big favorite, surely you're going to finish the guy. Yeah. But it don't play out like that. And you've been yeah. getting prices. Last week, the play, we, we had Devashvili over Borg by decision. No brainer. Devashvili is a decision fighter. Borg's pretty durable. Going to go to decision. Fight doesn't happen. Devashvili still goes to decision, right? The Andre Feely fight. He's a, he's a 220 favorite over Jordan. He's 120 by decision. Mm-hmm. Well, Feely's a decision fighter, and Jordan is very durable. Mm-hmm. Like, you, those fights, 185, I don't like that. 145, buddy. And I've got someone in Brianna Van Buren who, I'm not going to say a decision fighter, but when you're five feet tall fighting at 115 pounds, there's not a, there's not a whole lot of kinetic energy. Like, I, I don't see her knocking out someone in Tisha Torres who's gone three rounds with, with literally literally the greatest fighter in the history of this division. So one would have to imagine decision because we have Van Buren. Van Buren by decision, 145. Got to go that route. Jillian Robertson, your baby, takes on Courtney Casey. Minus 120, Robertson, plus 100, Casey. Hot takes here. Yeah, I mean, I think I got to go Jillian Robertson. I have a feeling that she could blow it for me, but the problem with Courtney Casey is that just the takedown defense is not there. And no. where is she totally got she away got with that? She got taken down. Totally got away, to away with, with it. it. Arm bar. Okay, so Barella has the fight as where she wants it. The takedown, pretty effortless. An arm bar for, from guard. I arm thought those, I didn't think those guard. existed anymore. I see them once in a while in this division. Yeah. Or 25 or 35, mm-hmm. but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, just not not a good look. But again, as much as you can see, be like, dude, dude, Casey just submitted a black belt off her back with an armbar. Impressive, impressive. We were all worried about was she just going to get taken down, and it kind of proven that she was going to get taken down. Now with Jillian Robertson, that's kind of her forte is these takedowns. She's got good top pressure, and she can get the takedown. But could she, she get kind tra- of, could she's she kind get of caught in known, something like she's that? She's been too, known but. to get give up submissions, mm-hmm. you know. Or as much as she has good cardio and she pushes a pace, she leaves these openings. Corny Casey's way more seasoned. She's had a lot more experience in the UFC. She's also, you know, probably a higher level of jiu-jitsu. But I don't know that it's so marginal that she just catches her with an arm bar off guard. And mm-hmm. I think Robertson gets the fight down when she wants. As far as the striking goes, Casey, decent striker. But again, 
going back to that long man style, I know she's not super tall or anything like that, but there's not a whole lot of power. It's mostly just set up, set up the punch, set yeah, up the punch, volume. set up the punch. Jillian Robertson crashes, crashes the pocket, lands two, lands three, backs up, or crashes through for the takedown. That style should be more effective. Fair. So again, this is probably a close fight. I see it going the distance, but I see the takedowns and the forward pressure being enough for Jillian Robertson. As long as she doesn't get caught in a submission somewhere later in the fight, she should be able to get the decision here. So Robertson, 120. Another minus 120 and plus 100 fight. We have Matt, the Steamroller for Vola, taking on uh, Frank... Does he have a nickname? Camacho. Frank the Crank. Frank the Crank Camacho. Uh, for Vola, minus 120. Camacho, plus 100. I think this, I mean, it's a Camacho fight. Every single one of his, it's an action-packed, you know. <laughs> fight this is night? like low-key, the, the fight of the night. Uh, yeah. It's like the, yeah. It's the hardcore's sneaky play for, like, fight of the night. If anybody offers those types of props. It's a Camacho fight. They always are that way. For Vola, likes to get down, too. Like, his fights are usually pretty high pace. Um... This is going to be a big DraftKings play here. And I'm going to go with Frivola in this spot simply because I like what I see from these New York guys right now. Aljo puts in the best performance of his career. Okay. Marab, obviously, his opponent drops out, puts up 13 uh, takedowns <laughs> in the follow-up. Yeah. These guys are looking like the cardio. Or I mean, Aljo did so fast that the cardio didn't yeah, have to get tested, but cardio. he always he's has cardio. cardio. I mean, these guys look like they've been putting in a good camp. For Vola's been in the room, I believe, with all of these guys, all of these yep. guys around his weight class, getting ready for all of this stuff. Um, I'm happy with what I see from the New York guys here. So um, it's a close fight, but Frivola is the guy that I want to be on. What about you? Listen, I hear you. I hear you. But similar to a fight that we broke down where it's like, okay, this is either bang or bust. You either get the KO or you don't get the KO. That's, that's the sense here, is that Frivola, I like what he offers here. He's got a really grinding game. He's got a great gas tank, and the guy's got the will to win. But, man, his striking is just extremely limited. He's willing to strike, but he's there to get hit. And he's shown, I don't want to say super chinny, but, I mean, he's getting stung pretty bad. Polo Reyes knocks him out of his UFC debut a minute flat. Polo Reyes never augmented to much a whole lot after that, but it was more so just he's there to get hit, you can knock him. Now, credit to him. He switches up the game plan. I'm not going to strike anymore. I'm just going to grapple on these guys. Grapple, grapple, grapple. Don't get into striking exchanges. Don't get hit. Don't show them the chin. Lando Venata seriously stung him. Jalen Turner, these guys are hurting him. He can grind through. He can get the win. I'm expecting him to do that come Saturday. I'm expecting him to grind through. Camacho, as much as he throws heat, you can, you can only go for so long when you throw heat like mm -hmm. that. Now, if you want to get in a dog fight with him, that's fine because he wants to plant his feet and swing from the hip. Dog fight, you want to plant your feet and swing from the hip. We'll see who that works out for. Unless your name's Jeff Neal, chances are Camacho's going to put it on you. He would definitely knock out the steamroll of Frivola if Frivola decided to stand in front of him and try to exchange some punches. But I expect Frivola to get through. However, again, if you play this fight out five times, it's going to be the Josh Emmett factor, same thing. Like, I, I, I would have to say Camacho packs a lot of... The power doesn't translate to, like, massive knockout wins. However, the way he's cranking these guys up, Frivola's not going to stand up to the amount of punishment that some of these past opponents have. So I got Frivola. It's a close fight. I think it would go out that way. If you're going to play it on DK, because, I mean, Frivola $8,200 has high upside. Yeah. Again, like we talk about in Ver Burgos versus Emmett, there's also very high upside in Camacho at 8000 that he yeah. could just go out there and score a first-round KO. That would not shock me for, to see him get the first-round KO. But I'm going to lean towards Frivola grinds on through, gets a decision over three. We have Roxanne Modafferi taking on Lauren Murphy. Modafferi, minus 120 favorite. Murphy, a plus 100. Another minus 120, plus 100 matchup. Give me the person with a lot more volume, cardio, pace, and the one that everyone just hates betting on, but she comes through as a big underdog every time. I have shat all over Roxanne. And not... Not nothing against her. I, I I respect her drive and her commitment. She's she's been put in some tough spots and she's looked pretty bad in some of those spots. But you see the improvement with this girl. You know that she's probably one of the people who is first to the gym in the morning, last to leave, grind. Dedicated. She does not have the physical gifts of Laura Murphy. Laura Murphy's jacked, super strong, right? She's blessed with a different type of body type. Sure. Uh, Mata Ferry just, and we're in Vegas. That's where she set up shop. Uh, give me the happy warrior. Um, nobody else seems to want to 
get on board with the Happy Warrior. That would be my pick in this spot. Laura Murphy, obviously, like a third round finish, but her last time out there. Um, otherwise, it's usually a lot of like low volume affairs. I think uh, the striking isn't great on Mata Ferry, but she can, if she can hold Murphy up against the cage or like just tire her out, she wins rounds two and three. Maybe it ends up being a better live betting opportunity. Um, you know, she has a rough first round and then just piles on the volume later on. That's my take on this as uh, as we talk about right now. What about you? Yeah, honestly, I, they're just I can't get behind Roxanne Modafferi, and I know there's been big spots in that last fight. She catches a huge ticket, kills me massively. Goddamn Macy Barber! Uh, I just I can't get behind her. It's not has nothing to do with the age. Has nothing to do with the miles on her. It just has everything to do with like as far as athleticism goes. I she's. She's got good takedowns, which is shocking to me because she's just not strong at all, but she gets the fight to the ground. And when she gets the fight to the ground, she does have good jiu-jitsu. we got to give her that. As far as the striking goes, she's developed into one of these people that just doesn't ultimately care if she gets taken down because she's got good jiu-jitsu that she'll just get in your face and throw, and she's willing to throw more. And like you said, volume. And maybe she'll just chip away at Laura Murphy. Laura Murphy's not exactly the rangiest fighter. Laura Murphy doesn't really let her hands go. But if anything, it's like Laura Murphy's just that trucker at the 7-Eleven that would just beat your ass, man. Like, she's so tough. Mm-hmm. She's from Alaska. She's Alaskan tough. I went from it's Alaska, like, moved to the desert in <laughs> yeah. Phoenix, Arizona. Like, two of the hardest climates I would imagine to live in. Yeah, and just, She looks desert slash Arctic tough. Yeah, what a, what a big switch, eh? But mm-hmm. also, she's five foot eight, so she's not going to give up this, like, massive height advantage to Roxanne Montefiore. And her thing here is that she's legitimately way stronger than Roxanne Montefiore. So where Montefiore got Macy Barber to the ground... Macy Barber, A, blew her knee out. I mean, you, you got to factor that yeah, in a little dad. bit, right? <laughs> well, if you asked his, her dad, she only had one leg. Like, mm-hmm. my God, she's very, very compromised in that spot, man. Should have thrown the towel if she was that bad. What are you mm-hmm. talking about? Anyways, she's a one-legged fighter, and, you know, Amata Ferry does exactly what she's got to do, takes her down, does outstrike her. How much was she? Co- how much does that take away from Macy? I don't know. It doesn't matter. With Roxanne Montefiore, can she repeat that? Is she going to go out there and take down Lauren Murphy? Well, that's where I have trouble coming to that, to that, uh, to that decision. I, I, I don't know. I don't think that she's going to be strong enough to peel her to the ground. I don't think she's going to be technical enough to just hit some type of outside trip or get a good takedown in. What I think is that Murphy's just going to push her back, win the grinding exchanges up against the cage, and just slowly grind away at her. I got Lauren Murphy. I got Lauren Murphy by decision, specifically. Uh, not a pretty fight, and I'm not saying that because of the both women's physical features i'm saying just it's going to be a grinding affair that goes 15 minutes that might not be the most exciting of fights but i i I just i gotta go laura murphy and plus (laughs) and plus i have not a whole lot of dogs on this card whereas people might say man going with the no dogs again it's like dude only two of them hit last week we had one of them and charles rosa you can't just chase dogs all the time there's spots where it's like oh that guy performed better than the odds suggested Mm yeah It's like you know. Jordan last week. Like hey, if you, if you were on Jordan last week, you were probably on the smart side of it. It didn't come through for you, but at that price, how the fight played out, it you know, is close by hair, basically. He drops him in the first round. Now you're feeling like a million bucks. You know, he's a live betting favorite after the first. It's mm-hmm. like, oh man, this guy's coming on. Second round's really close. Third round's really close. They're close rounds. You know, right guy wins in Andre Feely, and good thing he got that decision as well. But, yeah, they're close. So then you think, oh, geez, that was, I had a good bet. It's like, well, it was a losing bet. So was it a good bet? Is a losing bet a good bet? Well, it was the right side I, of the value. I disagree with that statement. If you have a big underdog and it's like yeah. a razor close decision, you were on the right side. You just didn't, it just didn't go your way that night. Like, that's how I like to look of at course, it. Of course, of course. If you have a big favorite and it ends up being super, super dicey and close, you're like, I wish I didn't get myself involved in this. So I consider that, even though it's a win, it's almost like a moral loss, you know? I was in a wrong spot. I got lucky to get out of it. Yeah, that's fair. That's how I look at it. Yeah, that's fair. I just see spots like the Josh Emmett fight versus Jeremy Stevens. It's like he drops Stevens in the first round, and then gets knocked down the second. Mm -hmm. Do you look at that like, I was all over that bitch. It's like, man, you, you could have just eas- as easily have lost it. Anyways, again, this is a close spot. It's an even money fight. I don't have a whole lot of dogs per se in the card. Yep. And so Lauren Murphy is technically speaking an underdog. But you want her by decision on top of yeah, that. Yeah, well, I'm gonna get I'm definitely gonna get plus Which money on that. The price on that it's gotta be at would least 135. Be Murphy that's plus one fifteen. Probably not worth it. I'll still take that though. Gotta get some plus money though. Really? She's Plus 100 straight up. 
plus 100 and or plus 115 yeah i wouldn't take the, i just take this just take her straight up in case she oh yeah yeah because she's a finisher i guess mata I mean, 15 points you're gonna risk that in case you know mata fairy comes out doing like a flying kick or something like that if, falls and gets pounded if i was betting 100 dollars, if i was betting 100 dollars in a straight bet on that yeah, hundred percent. I, I think just, that I would just I would just take it if I was putting her on a parlay, which I'm risking anyways. I'm definitely taking those extra fifteen points because of the multiplier. Okay, okay. And finally, I actually made a board for this one because I was really fired up about it after looking into Max Ra. Ra. I'm probably butchering his last name, but we're gonna learn it. I think um, Max Rosekopf. He's minus one seventy favor. Austin Harbor can be had for plus one fifty. I actually jumped in on Rosekopf after watching some tape. And looking into his story and his personal history, I jumped in at a, at a worse price. I don't really understand the most recent line movements on yeah, him. Yeah, sums up. Um, I see him, yeah, minus 165 in some spots, minus 170 in others. Here's the thing about him. Two-time uh, All-American wrestler. Love that. You know me. Right. I see that, and I go, okay, okay. You have my intrigue. North right. Carolina State University, a good program. NC State won the ACC. Um, he was the ACC champion in his junior year. Tore his labrum. So this is a guy who was well on his way to becoming a three-time All-American. When you start thinking about those guys, you have like Gregor Gillespie. Um, Gregor Gillespie, I guess Johnny Hendricks was uh, multiple time. I, th- I don't know if he got three, but Kurt yeah, Angle. Yeah. Kurt Angle was probably Daniel Cormier, I, I imagine. Josh ben Askren. Like, we're talking about, like, yeah, the, elite level wrestling. Getting that many All Americans, that is elite, elite, elite. But when he tore his label, he went, met up with Robert Drysdale, one of the best submission teachers in America, um, definitely in the top five, I would say, or well known at least. So he's working, he's got that as wrestling, now he's got the submissions, you watch some of his tape. Um, I see, I think his striking is definitely a work in progress. He's 25 years old. I'm expecting that from a guy of his age. I see a decent overhand right in his most recent fight um, on, was it Legacy Titan. or Titan? Um, I saw some like kicks and a little bit more creative. It just happened so fast. He had some problem. kicks and it was a little bit more creative. And I see people and I understand we know that Hubbard can go three rounds. We don't know that about Roscoff because he get because he usually just finds that submission super fast. He's super strong. He's got the submission skills and the wrestling. He doesn't even seem to have to use it because the submissions have been coming so easy. And here's the thing about the gas tank. Yeah. Tell, <laughs> tell me a th- well, he would have been a three time. Tell me a multiple time. Um, um, yeah, all, American, all American, D1 All American, sure, all American sure, sure. I'll tell you, who I'll has tell you. I'll tell you. cardio issues. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Tell me an Olympic silver medalist wrestler, a nine time Danish wrestling champion who has cardio issues. But Hubbard just got taken down a zillion times against Marco Madsen. Yes. And just made him worse. He's still lost. And Marco Madsen got real tired. Lost. Fair. Very fair point. Roskov has better submission skills than him. And, and Madsen, Madsen was, being Madsen was able to athlete. get into some positions. I don't think he had the technique to finish him out. That I agree with. That I, agree I think Roskov is going to get a first-round submission. That's what I actually see here. I think First-round submission. First-round submission. I'm, I'm waiting for that. that submission prop to open. I see him inside the distance at plus 135. We can get like a three to one him by submission. I'm in on that. I mean, I already have him uh, in some plays as it is this week. I I told my boy Pogi Rob that when I watched him, I got the same feeling as when I first watched tape on Israel Adesanya and Gregor Gillespie. Not in terms of their style, (laughs) just in terms of how excited I was about where we can go with this guy. I think this guy's legit. Everything I see on tape and his story, everything like that. I'm expecting big things from him. So I don't actually understand that line movement. I'm in on Max. All in on Max. Yeah. Here's what's refraining me from getting all in on Max. First of all, you nailed it, right? We don't know. We speculate that he can fight three rounds. But we don't realistically know. That is, yeah, it's a question. Whereas we 100% know with Hubbard that he can fight 15. He's going to fight 15 hard. He's durable. And he's at elevation. Same camp as Blades. He's ready for this fight. His camp is literally on fire. He trains with the greatest guys in the world, right? Meanwhile, Robert Drysdale is a jiu-jitsu guy. He trains jiu-jitsu. Max has been largely training in jiu-jitsu. Max can wrestle. Max can grapple. 
Paul, here's the question. Can Max fight? That that you don't know. So right away, that's going to be a bit bit of bit of a question mark, right? Don't know about the cardio. Don't know if this guy can take a punch in the face. Don't know if, if UFC jitters could affect him. Don't know about all that stuff. But here's a question for you, right? You're saying how great you like this guy, right? Jeez, could have been a three-time All-American, right? He was, he was a good, he's a good D2 or a D1 All-American. He has all of the two skills that just make me excited. Trains with Drysdale. Tra- mm-hmm. He's in Las Vegas. UFC's in Las Vegas. This guy's a natural fit to be on Main one Main training tournaments. partner of Dan Ige. Dan Ige goes out, beats Edson Barbosa in a striking match last time out. Main training partner of Dan Ige, right? Yeah. He's in it, Vegas, was- so like it's short notice, but hey, you're already there. I'm sure this kid's been getting ready. They probably had him on the, on the wire saying... You're in line if we need somebody at 155. You know the worry. You know what the worry becomes what? is that why, if he's such a great prospect, why would they be giving him a fight on a week's notice? Like Hubbard had an opponent. Hubbard was going to fight already. Because it's COVID and you need people. No, and then and then you say, oh, geez, well, I think this guy's going to take Hubbard down and submit him. Right, right. He probably does take Hubbard down. I mean, oh, Madsen, Madsen had him down eight times. No mm-hmm. doubt, he probably takes him down. Dobby Ramos couldn't submit him. Yeah. Davi Ramos is a legitimate ADCC competitor. This kid don't got nothing on Ramos, but Hubbard survived. Hubbard hasn't been submitted in four years. He's young. He's improving. He's at a top camp. I, I got Max. Don't get me wrong. I got Max on the basis of Madsen took him down eight times like nothing. The difference is Matt, Madsen has no top game. He's a good wrestler. He's no top game. When he got him down, he couldn't hold him down. I expect Max to take him down the same way, but when he does take him down, it's grind city. I get that. But I can't go all in on him. I can't go all in on him because there's too many question marks to where this guy's at. And also, as, as much as we explain, he's got all the skills in the world, and he's got a favorable matchup, and all these things. Only minus 170. Not a, it's it, He doesn't scream. People don't know who he is. Yeah, but people don't know who a lot of... Roosevelt Roberts, why is he coming into the UFC as a 3-1 favorite? Why do you see guys off Contender Series coming into the UFC as 3-1, to 4-1 four, four favorites? They have no business being big favorites. They just are, because people like these guys. We haven't this, talk- kid, this kid's undefeated. He's, he's an... He's a, all-American wrestling champion, which everybody loves. Yeah. He trains with the best American jiu-jitsu guy in Las Vegas, if not all of North America, or in the U.S., Robert Drysdale. Can't take anything from Dan Hurt, but Drysdale's one of the guys. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. Fuck, he's got it all, and he's taking on Austin Hubbard, and he's only a minus 170. There's, there's something there. So I'll leave it to this. I'm going to leave it to this. Maybe Pack can look this up real quick. It might be hard to find. <laughs> he's Dan Ige's top training partner. Is he managed by Ali? I'm not sure. If he is, I got him. <laughs> Fuck that's why you would get in on short notice sure. if they go this for is sure. a perfect yeah matchup. yeah because then because because then it would because then ali would be like oh whoa 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 we got a guy for i mean his first. other main training partners are puna soriano yeah ali guy they're all ali guys they're all Vegas, ali guys Vegas. they're at extreme couture don't you man this is the, this is this, and we've been talking okay, about these COVID markets me. the you problem is me. that most people don't watch tape when i watch tape i was just like this guy this guy has the goods Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty confident I'm right. Well, and one thing I will throw on that is that Madsen's like physically imposing and he has his way with Hubbard. And then as round three comes on, Hubbard's just, man, it's, it's too it's too hard taking down this big guy. This big guy's leaning on me. Madsen 5'8, Hubbard 5'10. This kid's 6'1. Like, he's 6'1 he's, and he's, he's got 73. He's pretty big for the weight class. He's got man. height and reach advantage over Hubbard as well. Okay, but if Ali doesn't manage him, he's trying to cut weight on a week's notice and he's big for the weight class, could go against him. If Ali does manage him, he's been training for six weeks. Yeah, for he knew he was going to get this fight long before Hubbard. Not did. only, not, yeah, yeah, it's like you're fighting Austin Hubbard, but he's signed to fight this guy. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't worry, that guy's out. Trust uh, me, trust I, me. I have, I have researched something. I don't know if this is right or not. What is Sucker Punch? Oh, is he Sucker Punch? Then That's, he's not. Then he's not. Dominion or Domination? Domin- I, domination? I don't know. Is, yeah, no. Sucker Punch Entertainment is uh, Brian. Who Brian knows, though? Name? These things, those things Brian change. Brian Butler. Yeah, that punch? could be what he's listed as, like, unless it's like a new news outlet or something like that. You know what? Greasy Theory? Because, like, you don't <laughs> Sucker hear, Punch you doesn't don't manage hear, him. It's just, you know, a little instance, you don't under the books. hear when somebody signs with Ali. Like, if some 5-0 and o prospect signs with that lead, that's not news, right? Yeah, so okay. he could have already been old. Right, right, if right. If all of his boys are over, I'm willing no, to wager see, that him and Ali have had that talk. Yeah, but Ige's Ali's boy, and he got set up with great opportunities right at the get-go. And Soriano, holy fuck, dude. Talk about a guy that's been set up with some nice opportunities right at the get-go. The, this kid's taking a final in week's notice. He's their training partner. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'll look into it more. He's got the skills. It's just, there's. I got a bad gut feeling on that one. All right, how, how about this? How about this? Then? What we got? Uh, his Twitter handle is maxout115, but it's three X's for Max. Let's go. Triple X. Max Payne. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> now Cody's into. All right, let's uh, rip through DraftKings here. Right. Start at the top of the board, move all the way down. Blades, obviously we like them. 
Yeah, I like Blades $9,400. He's got five rounds to deal with. He's got the takedowns to score your points. Significant strikes to score your points. Could knock him out. Could just butcher him for five rounds. Either way, that bodes well. 9400 is obviously a lot, but he's the biggest favorite on the card. People got faith in him, and he's got the kind of style that's going to get you that many points. Burgos versus Emmett. You want some exposure on both these guys, if you're possible. Not the same lineup, of course. Uh, Emmett is obviously the plus side, $7,500, and he's got a massive opportunity to go out there and get that K over Burgos, score mm -hmm. a ton of points. Burgos, meanwhile, he's probably going to rely on going three rounds, won't get you the finish. $8,700 is still a tad high, but if he wins, he'll, he'll get you those points. Mm -hmm. Just depends which one you're going with. I'm going with Burgos personally. We talked about conspiracy theories. We talked about how he's my boy. Whatever. You can make your choice on that one, whether you like Burgos or Emmett. They both got some merit, but I will admit the price tag is so much better on Josh Emmett, considering he's only plus 115, realistically. Pennington versus Renault, they're just not going to be high scores, right? Nope. Pennington's going to try to grind this girl down. Renault doesn't really have the gas tank to go hard beyond five minutes. Going to be low scoring. You don't want exposure to that, even though she's cheaper. Cal Pennington, too high. Pass on. Lyman Good versus Mah Bilal Muhammad. Yeah, you, you mentioned it. Bilal Muhammad would be a decent play if he came in appropriately priced at like eighty six hundred bucks, eighty five hundred bucks, yeah, eighty nine hundred bucks. You, I can almost. He's gonna be super low owned. I can almost guarantee like, you. I can almost really guarantee score, you he's so going the distance. Board. Yeah, I can almost guarantee you he's going the distance, right? So he's gonna throw a lot of strikes, but he needs to mix in those takedowns to get me enough points to get me up to that eighty nine hundred dollars. And Lyman Good, for as Lyman Good is very sporadic in that five fights in five years. What's that? Sometimes he shows up, and he looks awful. Sometimes he shows up, damn, he looks good. We don't know what version is going to show mm -hmm. up, but if he shows up half decent, $8,900 is going to be very tough. If he does show up half decent, though, his his problem with 73, even though good value. Chalk City, though. Could could get that. He's going to be A, Chalk City, and B, Blah Muhammad is also very durable. It's not like Lyman Good is a output guy and a takedown guy. No, he's he doesn't get do that a whole out. lot. He relies on the knockout. If he doesn't do a whole lot and doesn't knock out Blah Muhammad, even at $7,300, not a high score. Roosevelt Roberts versus Jim Miller. Jim Miller's going to go bang or bust, right? If you want to play a punt, DK... Yeah, D Jim Miller DK. wins round one. He's on the optimal lineup. Yeah, yeah. Flip side to that, if Roosevelt Roberts just gets out of the first round and just chips away at this guy and beats on him, then maybe he makes it happen. The $9,200 is just a little too out of my price range for Roosevelt Roberts. The 7000 on Jim Miller. If I'm playing one single lineup, he's not my most confident guy. No. If I'm playing a bunch of lineups and he's the definition of a punt type play, yeah. then maybe you go with him makes for sense. a punt. Bobby Green versus uh, Clay Guida. I think this one's likely, I'm thinking going to the decision, I think Bobby Green just does the cleaner work. Two things that we left off from the quick breakdown, I'll just throw in there. Clay Guida last win over BJ Penn. For the first five minutes of that fight, he's getting boxed up by BJ Penn. Pretty handily getting boxed up by BJ Penn. Tough scene. And, and then BJ going to BJ. He only had five minutes with the gas. Bobby Green, if he stands in front of Bobby Green, he's going to get boxed up left mm -hmm. or right. The other thing is Bobby Green loves to talk shit in the middle of the fight, right? Always. He's the best. You gotta keep this guy around. It's literally legendary. Go rewatch him versus Dracker close recently, too. He's like, oh my god! Uh, him on Affliction, Affliction 1. He looks at Oscar De La Hoya after that dick kick over J.J. Ambrose. He looks over at Oscar De La Hoya. He's like, oh shit, it's Oscar De La Hoya and Donald Trump. This guy's legendary. However, sometimes with the crowd in your ear, I don't know, maybe you don't hear him. If he stands in front of Gita and gets in Gita's head and just touches him up, even when Gita's holding him up against the cage and he's doing that short little inside work and he's to the body, short shots to the face and talking shit, he's going to end up getting the decision. I got Bobby Green. The $9,100, though, he'd really need to catch Guida. And because he doesn't have the submission game yeah. to do it, I'm going to pass on a DK, DK standpoint. Guy. Van Buren versus Tisha Torres, you're very much getting a, a kickboxing match, probably no takedowns. If she scores 100 significant strikes on Tisha, which is hard because Tisha's very mobile, 9,000 is just, you know, it's reflective of she's a big favorite on the money line. Maybe not even a big favorite, 185. She gets to 100 significant strikes. There's 50 points right there, plus the decision. If she gets a couple of takedowns, she gets to the 90. But I don't think, we don't have like the... She needs those takedowns. We don't have like the, the 120, 130 upside in the same way. Not a whole like, lot like of guys. Like a blades up top. Like yeah. he could absolutely, he could score 150 points. Not a whole lot of guys style on Tisha as well. And then when you look at the opposition that she she's faced, always it's running like, away oh, and Oh, and those are the people evading. that style on everybody, right? So... It's a little bit difficult yep. to look at it from that regard. True. Oscar Pachota versus uh, Barrio. I think you're probably going to want some... Nah, I, I don't know. Honestly, Barrio's going to decision. Last three fights in the UFC, been decision. Hasn't shown a ton of KO power. If Even if Pachota rolls over and gets super tired and he gets a third-round finish, there's not enough middle of the fight work. No, he can he's, get a third-round finish and score like 60 points. Right, and now he's only $7,600, but that still is something. The flip side of that on Pachota is that Pachota, know, Pachota's got the skills to finish. You know, Oh, he knocked out Tim Williams. By the way, he's getting pieced up by Tim Williams. Part of KOing him. Not mm -hmm. a great stand-up fighter. And oh, it's jiu-jitsu. Geez, hasn't submitted anybody in four years. Like, he's seemingly got skills to finish, but it'd be hard to finish Barrio. So I think you hit a pass on that one, too. Robertson at $8,300. That one's interesting. They're both interesting. They're both interesting because Robertson's going to score points based on her takedowns. When she does get takedowns, if she hopefully 
holds her down, works her way at her, improves some positions. We get some passes. We get some ground and pound. Next round, get another takedown. Maybe Courtney Casey gets back up. Maybe she does it all over again. Great. Mm -hmm, Courtney mm -hmm. Casey's flip side, if you're, you know, in Casey's regard, maybe she gets that submission. At $7,900, I feel like that could be low ownership fight. Could be important. Camacho versus Frivola. Frivola either grinds him, scores a bunch. Camacho catches him. Take your flavor on that one. We're leaning Frivola. I, I could see it going the other way, though. Murphy versus Roxanne out of fair. You got to think that one's going to be low owned. I'm, I'm having a look at Murphy. I know that sounds crazy, but $7,700. If she just gives her a royal grinding and they score that, I don't know. I don't know. I'm definitely going to have to look at that one a little more. And then uh, Roshkov versus Hubbard. Lock. That's your lock, lock. then for $8,400. you got to put him on DK as well. Um, he should be able, lineup. if he goes and gets those same eight takedowns that I Madsen believe what had, my eyes see. Yeah, no, no, I, fair, dude. Maybe I'm wrong, but fair. I like what I see from this kid. Fair. I see big things. Big things. Oh, well, he's fucked. <laughs> he's a, fucked. If he can take, if, if that's what why? you see, big things, he's I mean, in a lot of trouble. Man. I mean, Gillespie was a guy that I kind of thought the same. Who then got booted lopsided the head by Kevin by Lee. Kevin Your boy Lee. Justin Scoggins. Justin talk, Scoggins is a future world champion. We talk about fights. What's we, he doing right now? I Paul? mean, that was that was the one that got away for the sure. The one that got away. Um, no, but like for instance, with Gregor Gillespie, you, me, and you know this game. It's like if Gregor Gillespie and Kevin Lee fight ten times, that he doesn't lose by knock, head kick, knockout every single time. Gregor's going to get him down in some of those fights. Yeah, he's going to win yeah, the fight. I don't know. I don't, you would think like, that, right? One, but... one result doesn't mean that he's complete dust. What I haven't liked about Gregor Gillespie is that he just doesn't stay active enough. He likes to just be out fishing from the looks of it, and that's, I think, really stalled his career. This kid's 25. I see, I see that he's with the right training partners, working on the right skills, onwards and upwards. You know what? I got a question. What? Yeah. So... You got Blades as, like, your expensive guy. Yep. And then these two in, like, the low 8,000s. Maybe you throw Miller on in a GPP, save a bunch of cash that way. or Murphy Yeah, I like Blades and then these low guys. Yeah. But anyway, like, who's the other expensive guy besides Blades? Like, you're going to have salary. I guess Roberts? Yeah, no, I, I would, yeah, I'd say Roberts or Bobby Green. But Rob, Roosevelt Roberts, Roberts you got at least a sense that he probably could get that finish. You're going for the big GPP, whereas Bobby Green would be more of a cash game play. Even if he loses to Khalid Guida, not getting finished. Yep. Whereas, yeah, maybe Roberts gets blown out by Miller in the quick first round like we talked about. I, this could be one of those cards where, even though it sounds silly, you can just probably, those lower-end, mid-range plays, they're just there's going to be finishes. And we're seeing these on a lot of these cards. It's not the highest talent discrepancy. So there's a lot of fights like... Uh, Aguilera versus Ivy. It's the first fight of the card last week, right? Ivy, theoretically, unproven. Some shit looks good on tape. I'll admit, I butchered that one. Guy looked decent on tape. Was f literally in mid-process, falling over before punch landed him. Just so scared shitless to get in there. I don't know. I couldn't look at you in the eye and say, Max, not going to do the same thing. Because I just don't really know, right? So you've kind of got to... I trust the pedigree. Like these, these yeah, he's got a, he's got a way better time, pedigree. Way better pedigree. These multiple-time All-Americans on... show up to the UFC and they deliver. That's just what happens. Yeah, I, I don't know, dude. Like, I'd love, I'd love to say, yeah, I agree, because they've got the number one pedigree. But with Austin Hubbard, it's like he trains with all Americans every day. You know, he's been fighting in the UFC. He's got good cardio. His team's literally probably one of, if not the hottest team in the sport right now. And he's right in their weight class. Fuck, there's a lot to like about this guy over a debuting fight. And we keep talking about, like, last weekend, uh, Nam versus Adeshev. You got a guy, all this experience in Nam versus a debuting guy in Adeshev. And it's just like, Nam was just way more crafty mm -hmm. than Bruce Leroy versus Hooper. You got Hooper's got no experience, and, and Bruce Leroy's got all experience in the world. That's fair. But people are on Hooper. It's the same thing. This kid, this kid looks hot. He's undefeated. He's young. He's got good size. Trains at a good gym. He's got all this... He's got all this prospect status, but it's like we just don't really know if he can fight. If he goes out there and smokes out Hubbard, that's impressive to me because I mean, Hubbard's the fights that I have watched of him. This kid looks like he knows how to fight. Yeah, and they're not terrible guys. He's fighting either. No, but I, I do think he's not as good of a grappler as Davi Ramos, and Hubbard survived against him, and he's not as good of a wrestler as Madsen, and Hubbard survived against him. So he probably wins. I think he wins. I'm picking him as we talked about, but it could be a dicey spot. He's not on all my parlays. That's for sure. Fair enough. All right, uh, hit us with the PRP, and we'll get out of here. Hitting you with the PRP. Yeah, again, probably got a lot of favorites. Sorry with that, guys. We're going to go with Curtis Blades. Not sure on a prop on that one. We're going to go Shane Burgos, and I would take a decision prop. Burgos by decision. Uh, and by the way, if you're parlaying, don't don't be parlaying props. You know, that that's a way to get greasy. If you're parlaying, pick them straight up. If you're betting it straight up, you know, you don't want to put through 135 on Burgos. Take them by decision. We're going to go with Pennington by decision. Uh, Bilal Muhammad by decision. Rosebell Roberts. I don't like that fight at all. I could be talked into Miller, but honestly, Roosevelt Roberts is the play, and I'll take him by decision. Definitely by decision. Uh, Bobby Green, by decision. Van Buren, by decision. 
I'm going to take Pachota by decision. God, I don't love that. I'm going to take Barrio. I need a dog. Barrio's my dog. Ooh. Hopefully we get better dog money on him, but I will take Barrio as the dog. Jillian Robertson, 120 by decision. We're going to take Frivola by decision. Laura Murphy Lots by decision. No, no, and no, and I'm not just saying that because I'm running it through that. On the way to the office today, and I looked at all my stuff, this is a decision card. My opinion, decision card. Fights. At least we're in Vegas. Some guys are getting knocked Florida. out. Some guys knocked out. Curtis Blaze should be able to get a TKO. Emmett could knock him out. Definitely Emmett's got the ability to knock him out. Miller in that submission, potentially. Maybe Roberts grinds him away yep. late. Like, like Clay's chin's not gone. Van Buren versus Tisha is definitely going three. Barrio, all of his fights go the distance. Robertson versus Courtney Casey, like, that could be a finish. And Frivola Camacho could be a finish. And maybe Hubbard, but Hubbard's prone to be very durable. So even if your guy wins, probably by decision, no? I mean, mm-hmm. he's got a lot of quick finishes, so you tell me. Man, I trust I trust your take. You, you feel good about it, I'll go with it. But you, you know... I'm gonna How be calling up. I'm gonna be calling up his college roommates and figuring out the story on this guy. Like someone's not super high on him if the Vegas bookie didn't hammer it already. I think these COVID markets are nonsense, though. Okay, People could, look at, oh, this guy's a newcomer coming in on short notice. I don't watch tape. I'm just gonna bet the guy with UFC experience. But those guys have been winning, no? Like it's it's easier That's to true. stay ready when you're experienced. Like even though there's some older fighters on this card, those guys know how to fight. I just like that. At least Max's training partners have also been fighting recently. Yeah, yeah, and Hubbard's haven't, right? Because the Drew Dobers and the Justin Gaethys of the world and Blades is on the card. Sanhagen didn't look good, but training partner. You know, yeah, I, I fair, don't, fair, I don't fair, know, fair. I don't know, dude, whatever. It is what it All is. All right. right. Um, last thing I want to say, you know how much I like weigh-ins and watching the weigh-ins and getting a good sense? I jumped er- way too early, obviously. You were gone, or else you would have known. That was an easy one. I would have got myself way. out of uh, my investment. I, it wasn't killer. The real winner last week was Julie Avila. Like, she was, I had hammered. Hammered you her. You got her at 452. She went off at 700. I so got her at 400, beat. actually. Oh, there you go. There you um, go. That was the big one. But, yeah, the big issue, and I didn't see, I I went, I went, was on top of that mountain when I posted the thing. I had a whole bunch of questions. I saw one question about, like, uh, are you worried about I because she looked back I tried away. to answer everybody as much I as I could. Didn't I like, even get out of here. I didn't even get out of here, you fool. And then I looked it up, I think, yesterday. And I saw that she missed by, like, a quarter pound. I would have been out. <laughs> If you miss by like three, four pounds, I know you gave up your weight cut pretty early usually. Well, did you hear and the And then you started to rehydrate. When you miss by a quarter pound, that means you're grinding, 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 and still couldn't get it done. Those are the bad weight cuts. I would have got myself out if I had seen that. No, you would have either way. I would have got myself out on a loss, clearly. Like, I would but, have lost a little bit in the process, but I would have been spooked, for right, sure. Right, right. Okay, and you, w- you would have definitely got off. But behind the scenes, right, apparently Jessica I's team texts Cynthia Calvillo, and the manager tells her manager, Jessica I's going to miss weight by three pounds. Yeah. Just letting you guys know she's going to ma- miss weight by three pounds. Apparently, according to everybody, she comes to the weigh-ins and just grabs the t- towel and leans on it, and it comes in, it registers at a quarter pound over. Mm-hmm. She probably would have tried to cut she it. She DC'd it? She DC'd it. Wow. Now, now, Calvillo accuses her, right? I missed all this. Calvillo accuses her. The manager accuses her. They say, we got the text messages saying you're going to be three pounds overweight. How do you show up? How did you manage to cut two, over two and a half pounds since you sent us that text message? Like, how does that work? But then Jessica I gives out an official response where she's like, I don't want to get into it. It's the past. What happened happened. It's like, that's pretty much admitting guilt. Uh, it's just the fact that she looked real sick. And and just to cap on that really quick, that was a fight that you knew, regardless of the winner, you just knew it's going to go decision. You just know that. It's going five rounds. When when the pivot off uh, I happened to Calvillo, Calvillo by decision was plus 165. Like, again, it, just, it, didn't, it didn't make any sense to me. I don't know why they have these fights going by decision props and, like, w- a certain fighter to win by decision specifically – even even the top rank card last night, you couldn't bet it unless you bet them to go to decision. And by the way, it was five for five on fights going to decision. So I would say if you're chasing value, if w- there's not a whole lot of plus money. I'm not giving you a whole lot of plus money dogs. I can offer you some plus money by hitting some of these guys by decision. That that would be the move. Cool. Yes, sir. Any other final thoughts? No, sir. Just race uh, Friday, Grand River, Barney Google. That's my horse. Racing, race number seven. Got the rail. Raced so fucking bad last Barney week. Barney Google. Oh, but it was a tightener. Been off for three months in quarantine. Are we betting? Are we betting him? I'd like Is to. Is he say ready to win? No, but if you're gonna bet him like on a show ticket, like top three, top that would be three. the move. 
Barney Google? Yeah, Barney Google. His mom's name's Oogle Google. I didn't name him. We ended up with him as I'm a three. two-year-old. Well, I'll, I'll put a little chicken scratch on that. You've got like What's 14 books, so I'm sure some of them offer horse racing, Paul. Yeah, Paul well. is the king of the books. Am I? Well, anyway, that wraps up for us <laughs> this week. Am I? That wraps up for this week. Thank you to Cody Safde for gracing us with our presence in studio again. Thank you to Pat Mayo behind the sticks doing a great job. Uh, making life easy for me uh, by switching the show this week. Uh, for Cody and Pat, I'm Paul saying goodbye and good luck. Experience! Experience!